Good morning and welcome to Unity of Kanawha Valley Sunday service for September 26th. We begin our service with the ringing of the bell and the lighting of the Christ candle. We ring this bell and we light this candle as a reminder of the Christ light that shines in each and every one of us. So if you would, repeat with me our opening statement. Together, there is only one, one presence, presence and one power, and one power and in the universe, universe and in and my in life. life. God, God the good, good omnipotent. And then repeat it with me once more. There is only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life. God, the good, all Our songs, Our songs this morning are led by Ron and accompanied by Jeff. Good morning. Would you please stand? We'll sing Surely the Presence, which is right inside your front cover.
once again to Unity of Kanoa Valley. And we have some first time visitors. Do you want to introduce those guys, them? Let's give Bobby oh, Lee a wanna, big call. Can pull. I add something? Uh, Doug and Bobby Lee are both responsible for those great videos. Uh, late in bed, they changed them. So. Yeah. Thank, you. Oh, thank you, thank you. We're so happy you're here this morning. Oh, welcome, Kate. <laughs> Wonderful. Hey, Sadie, good to have you here. <laughs> oh, my. Well, we do have some announcements this morning. We're still collecting luggage and backpacks for the children at the Davis Children's Shelter so that as they, this gets me every time, I'm sorry, as they transition from the shelter to home so that they don't have to take their belongings in uh, garbage bags. Uh, we collect backpacks and luggage for them. And just, um, you can bring them here to church on Sunday or you can let Pam know and she can arrange a time for you to bring them here and then we make sure they get to the shelter. The Sojourner Shelter is, in, is collecting coffee and school supplies for September. We have a barrel at the end, bottom of the steps here, or there again, just let Pam know when you would like to drop those off here, and we'll make sure those get to the shelter. Uh, we would ask you to please volunteer, be a part of our service. There are several ways you can do that. We have a sign-up sheet right here, and as you can see, October is totally empty. <laughs> So we have lots of opportunities for you to participate, either as a daily word reader or as an usher. Uh, we would love to have, uh, to share the joy, let's put it that way. In the pews, you will see the membership renewal forms. If you have not yet renewed your membership, please fill that out and you can put it in the collection plate as it comes around. And on October 10th, is that two weeks from today, I believe, is our annual meeting. So if you want to be a voting member during the annual meeting, you will need to renew your membership. Uh, so mark your calendar. The uh, membership meeting will be held directly after the service on Sunday, October 10th. We're also looking for Sunday school teachers if you have a calling in your heart to share with the little ones, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. All materials and instructions are provided. So that's all the announcements I have. I will turn it over to Sky. All right, thank you very much, Janet. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, shalom, namaste, aloha. The light in me greets the light in you. My name is Sky Kirshner. I want to welcome you to Unity of Kanawha Valley Online. Thank you for being with us from wherever you are. I was asked to say a few words about why we do an annual renewal of our membership. Uh, there's a bit of a history to it. Uh, part of it is because sometimes people would become members and back before Google, what, what's the guy's name who invented the internet, that vice president, uh, what, yeah, Al Gore invented the internet. Sometimes people would move away, we wouldn't know where they were, they'd be on our membership rolls, and we didn't have a way to ask them what they wanted to do about that, and then the annual meeting would come around, we needed a quorum of at least, I think it was half the membership, and we had 
20 people who we had no idea where they were or what to do with them. So uh, we decided, uh, partially based on a recommendation from the mothership, uh, Unity Grand Central, uh, they, uh, their uh, recommendation for uh, bylaws uh, was to have an annual uh, renewal of your membership. Am I saying that closely enough? Barbie likened it to the library asking you to verify that your contact information is correct. So uh, that's, uh, that's all that that is, and that's in your sheets if you're interested. If you're interested in becoming a member, there's a little check off there too, and uh, you can do it that way as well. Barbie is, uh, has been doing an amazing job at uh, what we are temporarily calling the Unity House Cottage Building. Myrtle's Place. Uh, Myrtle's Place on the... Uh, Barbie's, dream house. <laughs> Bar Barbie's Dream House. Thank you, Danny. <laughs> Dan Danny, Barbie's uh, <laughs> second getaway. Um, but it's across the, uh, the parking lot. It's, uh, it was the parsonage uh, when this was a Methodist church. It was the manse when this was a Presbyterian church. It's where the pastor lived. Actually, the addition that they built down here was where the first pastors lived, uh, but um, then they, uh, they built that, that house. Uh, we, uh, our longtime friend and member Blue, Fred Westfall, uh, passed away, as you know, a year ago, and uh, we're, we're still cleaning out, and um, I think most of the furniture is out there, just a few things left, and Barbie is asking for three or four people who are willing to help carry some things to meet her over there immediately after the service. So if you feel capable of joining in that, uh, and if we have more than four, that's great. That'll just uh, make it that much easier. There will be a discussion group immediately after the service, and Unity Kids Camp continues every Thursday at 5 o'clock, uh, 5.30. We go from 5.30 till 6.00. The mission of Unity of Kanawha Valley is to provide you with a welcoming community of love, acceptance, and spiritual growth. We celebrate our unity in being alive together, and we affirm our diversity that each of us is on our own journey of growth. It's my personal goal that you'll feel welcome while you're here with us today, that you feel free to be yourself and feel free to explore some ideas that might be useful in your life. Today we will be looking at the idea of letting go of words, letting go of words. Prayer is a central part of what we're about here, so let's do a short one right now. Would you soften your gaze? Feel free to close your eyes if you feel comfortable doing so. Let a smile come to your face. And if you would like to use words, say silently to yourself, I am free to imagine a world of love. I am free to imagine a world of love. And if you would imagine someone you love or who loves you standing or sitting in front of you. You can pick anyone you would like. This is not limited by time or space or life or death. Look them in the eye. Imagine them saying to you, you are free to imagine a world of love. And would you say back to them, thank you for being with me on this journey. And if you would like, give yourself a nice big yawn, a nice big stretch. If you're with somebody who you feel comfortable touching and they feel comfortable touching you, turn to them and say, thank you for being with me on this journey. Thank you for being with me on this journey. I want to thank each of you for being here today. Your 
being here is part of the world that we're creating. Every small thing you do makes a difference. I wanna thank the universe, God, the source of all life and love for another day on this amazing journey. I wanna thank everyone who's made this service possible for Stephen and our board of directors, Barbie, Jamie, Rich, Peggy, Laura, and Kathy. We had our, some of those folks had their last meeting because uh, we're transitioning to a new board that will happen at the uh, annual meeting, which is in two weeks. I wanna thank Pam, our church administrator, over in the corner, thank you, Pam. I wanna thank Ryan and Ron and Jeff, Ryan is in absentia, but Jeff and Ron for our, being our masters of music, for Janet, our worship leader today, for Danny and Rich, our Zoom Meisters, for our amazing prayer chaplain, Sharon, Janet, Marianne, Laura, and Alexa, and our daily word reader today, Barbie Dahlman, and our junior bell ringer today was Sadie. Sadie, would you stand up and wave to us, please? Just give us a nice big wave. Thank you for ringing our bell this morning. All right, getting help with the wave. I want you to know that I continue to lift up every member and friend in my mind's eye every day. I'm so grateful for the chance to walk with you on our journey together. And I want to remind you that God is our source. The pen is in your hand and a new day is dawning for us all. So let's go into a more extended period of prayer. You might notice the sounds that are in the room. Buzzing from the equipment. Children adjusting, adults adjusting. You might notice the experience of being in this place, whether it feels warm or cool to you, the point of contact between the floor and the bench and your body the sensation of air on your arms and on your face. You might notice the sensation of air coming through your body, particularly at the point at the tip of your nose, the feeling of air moving across your top lip, and falling of your shoulders, the movement of your diaphragm and stomach as we deepen the breath. This exchange, the giving and receiving of air of the body which happen without words, the intelligence of our bodies 
on a nonverbal level. So much going on under our awareness, beyond our awareness. We know it's all happening. We don't know why with, or how with our words. It just happens. It works so well together. Almost as if the unconscious processing and processes of the body are a metaphor for the unconscious and nonverbal processing of the entire universe. Systems moving, working together. for some purpose that we do not have articulation for. Jesus, the Jewish mystic, speculated that love is at the foundational reality underneath everything else going on in the world and in the universe. This idea uh, in a strange way supported by Nobel Prize winning physicists who wonder at the experience of gravity, this bonding force that holds us together. Something beyond words is going on here. And it's from this place of mystery, this place of quiet peace, that we reach out to anyone, anywhere, in any need or trouble. We know that the presence of love and the awareness of this connection with our source and with the universe is available to all people at all times, regardless of identity, regardless of circumstance, with no exceptions. And that the awareness of this connection is possible at every time, in every place, to every person, including us right here, right now. And for this, we are grateful.
daily words for today. Let go, let God. Divine love, wisdom, and understanding express through me. If I feel unsure of the next step in any situation, I let go and let God. I don't walk away from difficulty or try to force resolutions. Instead, I release my tight mental grip on problems and open myself to solutions. I let go of my ego's desire for control and my need to bring about specific outcomes. I believe there are solutions and remedies beyond what my mind can conceive. I yield to possibility. I trust the indwelling divine presence just as I would trust a mentor. Letting go and letting God means creating space for the dynamic creative energy of spirit to inspire and surprise me. Divine love, wisdom, and understanding fuel my thoughts, express through my words, and guide me in all ways. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. Psalm 8611.
So bring your laughter, bring your tears, your busy lives and your careers. Bring the pain you've carried for years. All is welcome here. Freedom is not so far away. There's only one price to pay. Live your dreams and let them fade. Let them fade and let them go. Live your dreams and let them go. down and he says, I'm sorry, uh, but um, I don't know how to say uh, say this. Is it Hawaii or Hawaii? The lady says, Hawaii. He says, oh, thank you so much. And she says, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you saw that coming from 50 years ago, right? Okay, put your hand on your arm, please. I don't think you're coming. I'm picking Oh, my God. Well, that's good. It wasn't that good. The choke. Oh, no, I'm coming through. The choke wasn't that good. Either. No, no, no. You didn't, you didn't miss anything. It, yeah. And put your hands on your heart, please, and repeat after me. This is my heart. This is my heart. Through it, I am connected. Through it, I am connected. To my neighbor, to my source, and to myself. To my neighbor, to my source, and to myself. I am learning to trust it in all things. I am learning to trust it in all things. And I am grateful. Well, uh, today we're going to be talking or about praying without words, how to be free in our thoughts to simply imagine or simply to be without words. Uh, you know, we live in a word-dominated culture. Uh, we have words flying at us all the time. and. That's only part of our brain, right? The word 
part of our brain, which side is it? It would be the left side of our brain is, you know, the one that's using rational thought and logic and putting all these words together. But there's a whole another part of our brain that's going on without words, and that's why things like music, that's why the visuals are so important. That's why video is such an important medium, because you can combine music and image and words in the whole package. As, as I was printing off the, uh, the lesson today, it's two pages, and uh, I got an error message on my printer that said, black ink is massively low, you know, running out of ink, your words may fade. <laughs> I thought, okay, thank you universe for that little, little wink. Uh, right, you're, you're, so I thought, okay, so maybe I'll get halfway through and then I've got faded words here, which would be absolutely perfect. Unity began with silent unity. And silent unity, as most of you know, was a prayer service. It was a sitting silently in a circle, most people well, I don't know what most people were doing with their minds, practicing affirmative prayer, which uses words, but also kind of lulls the brain into a different state because we say the same word over and over again, or the same sentence, the Lord is my shepherd. With every exhale, the Lord is my shepherd. Or I am a child of God, I do not inherit sickness. Martella Witsit, uh, Linda Martella Witsit, one of the Unity Ministers, wrote a book a number of, just a few years ago called How to Pray Without Talking to God. It's a beautiful idea to be in prayer without having talking be part of what you're doing. Even C.S. Lewis, as conservative a theological thinker as C.S. Lewis, said praying Prayer without words is the best. Now, my first exposure to the idea of learning without words or, or even praying without words or to kind of unity thinking happened of all places from an old LP that my family had all these LPs of Broadway shows, uh, uh, Paint Your Wagon, uh, you know, carousel or whatever, you grew up with the same kind of thing, listening, and one of them was of The Music Man, and if you remember the movie The Music Man and what was the method he used to teach the kids, it was called the think method, right? Thank you, Livy, and it didn't involve, it didn't involve words, it didn't involve even notes, right? It involved this. So he would play this all over and over again, and then it would start to, you know, that's my Johnny up there playing the trombone. <laughs> Perfect. So you remember that, right? La da da. So you, you just get them to hum the thing and then think, but not thinking with words. That the, the musical instruments hadn't arrived yet. He thought he'd be gone by then, but he fell in love with Marion, the librarian. And so he winds up staying and he's hoping the kids will put something together. That is an interesting approach to learning something, to kind of imagine that you can do it and then seeing what happens. We know that in the Olympics, now these folks aren't just imagining, they are practicing, 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 but they are also imagining the ski run, imagining the tennis game, imagining whatever it is that they're engaged in. The book, Think and Grow Rich, uh, I thought based on the title, it was all going to be about imaging and that somehow money would come, imagining money would come, but that wasn't what the book was about at all. It had to do with thinking about what do people in the world need and then providing that service freely. It starts with the thought though, 
You know, even if you take, take a thought that Jesus had of moving a mountain, if you say to this move, mountain move, it, it will be moved. And, you know, probably at the time people thought well, that was kind of a crazy idea, although Herod was moving mountains to build his things. The Romans were big mountain movers and uh, started with an idea. Now, is moving a mountain a good idea or not? You know, you, you know the, the, we, we're still debating that. You know, but every thing begins with an idea, whether that idea is in words or in images. Some of you have used vision boards, uh, which was made popular by the movie and the book, The Secret. You know, you just think about what, what would you like to bring into your life and putting, putting those images out there. I remember when I was single, I was reading, you know, look around your head, a feng shui book, I would look around your room, and or I, I was in a room, I was, oh, there goes the battery. Still on there? Okay. No, still good. So, uh, you know, do I have any images of pears? No, it was all solo <laughs> images, right? If I want to be in a partnership, I need to start kind of thinking about what, just imaging, partnering. Now, this idea goes way, way back in a goofy kind of way, and I, I, I've shared this once before, I know, in the, in the 16 years I've been here, but it's such a goofy and wonderful story, I thought I'd share it again, from Genesis 30. Uh, Jacob, you remember Jacob, he's the one who stole his brother's birthright. Remember, he and Esau are twins, their father's Isaac, Jacob, uh, Isaac's dying, and so Jacob dresses up as if he's Esau in hairy garments, and uh, uh, you know, can, Isaac is blind, and he wants to give his birthright. I don't completely understand how that whole thing works, but, or, or why it happens, but at any rate, it was important to him to get it. His mom is pushing him, right? His mom is saying, yeah, get in there, get in there. I don't know why, what she, the problem she had with Esau was, but at any rate, she's pushing Jacob to do this. He gets the birthright, and when Esau finds out, he's pretty angry, and so Jacob flees, because he's afraid Esau's gonna kill him. So he flees, he goes to another land, he goes, to, stays with some relatives, uh, he meets uh, this woman, Rachel, at a well, uh, she's cute, I, 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 through the mask, I guess, she can see, he likes her eyes, and uh, they have a nice connection. He's feeding like his, his sheep, or maybe she gives him some water, because she's got a way to draft it at any rate. Um, they fall in love, and so he goes to the father and says, I'd like your daughter's hand in marriage, and she, he says, great, and they have a wedding, and it turns out he gets married to Rachel's, Rachel's sister, Leah, which is a funny part of the story, right? Because that's the same thing Jacob did to his dad. Now in the karmic story, right? Now Laban is doing that to Jacob, switches, switches daughter because uh, Leah's older. Right? So, oh, no, you, you, when he complains, he says, yeah, you, I can't marry the younger one when the older one's unmarried. So then there's that deal, you gotta work seven years before you can marry Rachel, right? So he works his seven years and he marries Rachel. So now he's got two wives and, uh, and all of this. There's all this like tricking of people in the Jacob story. Jacob, as you remember, later on changes the name to Israel. And so the children of Israel, who Jesus is part of and who we are part of that tradition, is a tricker. You know, basically, he's a tricker. Kind of like the, the, the music man, in a way, I guess. At any rate, here's another. In, in Genesis 30, we have this other story, this weird story of another trickery. So Jacob's got, you know, his family. He's doing well. He's increased Laban's flock uh, by a lot. And he goes to Laban, and he says, hey, let me go, you know, let me take your daughters, let me take some of the flock, and you know, I, it's time for me to spread my wings and kind of establish my own household. <coughs> and Laban says, uh, you, you know, you've done amazing here, you've brought prosperity everywhere he goes, Jacob is bringing prosperity. 
he says, uh, Laban says, name your wages and, and I'll pay them and you can go. And Jacob says, well, uh, how about I'll go through the, the flocks of all the sheep and all the goats and I'll take any sheep or goat that's speckled or, or you know, that isn't all black or isn't all white. I'll take all of the, the, the kind of blemished ones. And Laman says, oh, that sounds like a good deal to me. And part of the idea is then you'll know, you'll know whether that I'm treating you fairly because I won't have any all white or all black sheep or goats in my flock. I'll just have the speckled ones and you'll have the, the, pure, the purer ones. So Laban says, great, that sounds fine. So they divide the flocks off. Uh, Laban's got his, flo uh, his flocks. He, Jacob gives the speckled ones to his sons and they go off three days away. So they're not gonna intermix the, uh, the flocks. Jacob stays with Laban uh, to, uh, to kind of work out some more stuff. And uh, he's gonna be there for another couple of years. And uh, so he's got the pure white and the pure black sheep and goats. And um, after they have this agreement, Jacob then, and this is what the scripture says, Jacob took fresh branches from a poplar, almond, and plane tree and made white stripes on them by peeling the bark and exposing the inner wood of branches. So he's taken these branches and he made them spe striped. He made them speckled. So they're, they're, they're brown and white and brown and white and brown and white. And then he placed the, peel, the peeled branches in all the watering troughs so that, the, when, so that they would directly be in front of the flocks when they came to drink. When the flocks were in heat and came to drink, they made it in front of the branches. And so the white and the black goats and sheep bore young that were streaked and speckled or spotted. Science back in the day of Genesis 30, that's, that's where we get, even today we get this idea. And I, there are a number of uh, commentaries on this, you know, is this real science and people trying to make it, turn it into science. I'm not quite sure it worked that way, but there is something to this idea that if that's something you want, putting that in front of you and putting the images in front of you, you know, he's not using words here saying, give me more of these. He's just putting images of speckled and striped things in front of the cattle. And lo and behold, uh, that's, he starts reaping that. I mentioned last, uh, last week that I would tell you the story about how Maria Celeste got a dog. And uh, I'll tell you, when she would come to us saying she wanted a puppy and using her words, it just was getting annoying. You know, we weren't, we weren't sure if we, we had had a dog a, a few years before. There was, you know, shedding and stuff like that. We weren't sure we wanted a dog. Maria Celeste was insisted she wanted a puppy, she wanted a puppy, and she kept bringing it up and kept bringing it up. And I said, you know, it's kind of backfiring on us that how much you're bringing this up. Stephen, can I get an amen on this with three boys, right? So, uh, right, so, I, so I said, you know, you might be better served if you just started going through magazines and going on the internet and getting pictures of puppies and putting them on the refrigerator without any comment. I thought that was a pretty good idea. Well, over the next couple of weeks, our refrigerator got so full of pictures of puppies, you could barely open it. In fact, sometimes she would put it over the <laughs> door so that you couldn't, you couldn't, you know, the freezer and the thing. It was just full of pictures and puppies. And I gotta tell you, she was finding the cutest pictures. And those puppies were just getting cuter and cuter. She knew what she wanted. She knew exactly what she wanted. She kept putting up there. And finally, Maria and I, my wife, looked at each other and we said, I guess we're getting a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know, it works with cattle, it works with parents. Uh, I thought it was brilliant, uh, she, uh, she did it. And we ended up getting a puppy and uh, we're very happy with her. She looks just like all the puppies that were on our refrigerator door. Praying without words. 
praying in images. As you all know, uh, when I pray for someone, that's all I do. I lift them up. When I pray for our friends, for our members, for those people I know who are struggling, I don't know what to ask for. I, I, I don't, the words just kind of get in the way. Uh, and so I just lift them up and see them surrounded by light and love. I, my ego is, I, I wanna try to keep my ego out of it as much as possible. I don't know what's the best for this person in this situation. I just don't. And so I lift them up. I see them surrounded by light and by love. And I trust that whatever happens will be good, even if it's not what my ego wants. So I want to recommend a praying without words. Uh, one, it releases us from being annoying. To, uh, to parents or to God. I don't, I don't think God gets annoyed, but I'd be annoyed if uh, people kept begging me for stuff. Praying without words uh, in a way releases us from the hows and from the outcomes. It releases us from worrying about the outcomes. I just see the person surrounded by light and by love. I see the situation surrounded by light and by love and I let go of the outcome. And praying without words recognizes that there is more going on here than what our egos can understand. So I wanted to see, we've got uh, a minute or two, I want to see if anybody would like to share a story uh, from your life experience of praying without words. Uh, so if anyone has, a story, sometimes these are kind of funny things, sometimes these are very, I know you do this, right? You've, you've done some amazing things in your life without, without words. Would you be willing to share one, Janet? Well, you're taking your mask off, so I'll take that as a yes. Is, I kind of do both, I guess, is that I put it. Could you, could you come over to the oh, center so are you? Okay. For me, I do like to put it in words first, just so it helps me get a clear picture in my mind as to what it is that I want or need or think will further my soul along. Um, but then once I've done that, I don't need to keep repeating over and over and over if I can simply picture Hmm. this picture and put myself in this picture and get the feeling of having this in my life. I'll give the example of um, when I needed a car. And at first, I was picturing myself riding places, and sure enough, I got lots of rides to lots of places. And then it hit me, oh, I have to picture myself in the driver's seat. <laughs> And so when I made that distinction of putting myself in the driver's seat and feeling myself in the driver's seat, that's when it came about that I was able to have a car. So for me, and, and I recent, I'm taking a course right now online, and one of the points that they made is that you're having a thought and then writing it down is the very first physical manifestation of that thought. And that just slapped me upside the head. That I have the thought and the first physical manifestation of that is me writing it down. But then I do have to take it that step farther. I have to take it to the place without words where I simply feel it. And you put that, the words on those papers and those feelings together, and, and I don't think there's anything that you can't accomplish. That's my opinion <laughs> and, and my experience. But sitting in silence, and like Sky said, just picturing the light and love, there is nothing, nothing, nothing like that at all. And I think then that helps you uh, to phrase the words and that helps you to get the feeling and 
just to know the goodness that is there for everyone. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Okay, I've rambled enough. I'll give it to you. Thank you so much, Jan. Yeah, the reminder of the importance of emotion connected to that. Anyone else? Barbie? Yeah. Barbie and then Peggy, and then we'll bring it on home. One of the things I often do with Facebook is as I run across people, especially people that I haven't seen in years and years, is that I will just sit with my eyes closed and think about them, and I see their eyes twinkling and a smile on their face. And I just imagine them feeling love in their hearts and feeling at peace. And that's, you know, that's my idea of how I pray for these people, that I see them happy and joyful and filled with peace and calm. Well, thanks, Barbie. That goes right along with what I was going to say. My son came over yesterday, and some of you may know him and some of you may not, but please don't share with him what I'm about to say. <laughs> <laughs> no don't tell him. And you on Zoom, too. Um, we were sitting on the front porch, and somehow we got started talking about people on Facebook and people in particular that he was not in line with. And he said, and he's not very demonstrative with his feelings. He's, that's another story. But um, he said that for the longest time, he would see something that somebody said, and he would say to himself, I hate that, I hate that. You know, he was just, he wouldn't, and he, well, it started out when he had this um, trip he went on last month. And he said, you know, this really good friend of mine and his wife never once liked any of my pictures that I posted from my fabulous trip. And he said, I got to thinking about that, and I got to thinking, well, I don't always like pictures that other people post, but you know what? He said, it makes me feel good when somebody likes something that I post. So instead of just scrolling by everything that people have posted on Facebook, he said, I'm going to start liking those. And he said, you know, it, it made me feel better inside. He said, just like a certain ex-president that we had, <laughs> I, he said, I would say, I hate so-and-so, you know. And he said, I stopped saying that because I realized that it was, it was making me feel bad. And so for him to say that, for him to make that connection, you know him, was just amazing for me. It was is is big stuff for him, but he's turning that hate feeling around into a feeling of caring, and maybe not love, but at least like. <laughs> well, let's hear it for our sharers, Barbie and Peggy and uh, and Janet and Janet. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for being here and considering this idea. So, if the ushers would come forward, please. You'll find the offering blessing on the inside of your bulletin. It's number two. And repeat that with me together. Divine love moving in and through me. Blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. I give in love. I trust God. And I am grateful. Here's a song by one of my favorite songwriters, Peter Mayer. Jesus spoke, entreating them, 
to live together in a great circle of love. And when his followers asked him then who should be included, Jesus said, let everybody in, everybody in, everybody into the circle, circle, everybody, everybody, everybody into the circle, circle. Oligarchs and tyrants try to keep some in and some outside till revolution sweeps across the land and the people all stand and the common folk cry. Let everybody, everybody, everybody to the circle, circle. Everybody, everybody, everybody to the circle. Now sometimes a circle is a class or a creed Sometimes a circle is made of only men Until Susan B. Anthony says, what about me? Let me in, oh, everybody in, everybody in Let everybody in to the circle, circle Everybody, 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 everybody To the circle, circle Still the circle is a privileged thing, excluding people for the color of their skin. Until the voice of Martin Luther King says, let freedom ring, let them in. Everybody in, everybody in, everybody in to the circle, circle. straight, rich or poor, whole or broken, open up that door. There were, can we start that again? Because I got all confused and something about words, I think, for a sky. Gay or straight, rich or poor, whole or broken, open up that door. The more we are, the greater we become. After all, we are all one. Bring in the people that don't stop there. Bring in the fish in the sea, the birds in the air. Bring in the river wide and the mountains tall. We go together or not at all. Everybody in, everybody in, everybody in to the circle, circle. Everybody, 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 everybody in to the circle. Circle, circle, everybody, everybody, everybody in the circle, circle. Say for Jeff Hart on piano. Oh, thank you, Ron and Jeff. Wow. So we give thanks for these gifts and offerings and everyone who is welcome here, everyone who supports this church with their time, with their talent, with their treasure. We are so grateful to each and every one and hold everyone in the light and in the love of God. So we say thank you Thank you, thank you, and so it is, amen. Now, if you'd like to stand, we'll do our peace song and uh, prayer for protection. I know, I know my birthday last week, that was uh, Janet Hamilton. Anybody else have a Anniversary, birthday? Anniversary, for me in like 22 years. Woo!